Good afternoon. My name is Professor Marcus Schleich. I'm a renal physician and hypertension specialist and head of the Neurovascular Hypertension and Kidney Disease Laboratory at the Baker IDI Heart and Diabetes Institute in Melbourne, Australia. Thank you very much for joining us today for the Hypertension Virtual Education Summit on the topic of innovations in hypertension management with a specific focus on renal denervation. This program is presented by Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University at Cardio Care Life. We are very fortunate to have assembled an outstanding faculty of experts in the area, including Professor Luis Rui Lope, Professor Deepak Butt, and Professor A.J. Katani, who I will introduce in more detail a bit later on. In the next three hours or so, we will cover a range of important aspects relating to resistant hypertension and the role of renal denervation in its management. The program is divided into three one-hour sections, each comprising a 20 to 30 minute presentation followed by interactive discussion. Today's session will allow us to take questions in real time throughout this presentation and I therefore uh, would like to encourage you to send us your question anytime by typing them into the box located at the lower left hand side of your screen. You're now tuned in to the first live session on the topic of understanding resistant hypertension with Professor Luis Rui Lope. I'd like to introduce uh, Luis, who is a uh, professor of medicine from Complutense University in Madrid, Spain. Professor Rui Lope is also head of the hypertension unit at 12th de Octobre Hospital, and his research focuses on hypertension and the kidney. Luis, thank you very much for joining us today, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation on understanding resistant hypertension. Luis? Well, thank you very much, Marcus. It's a pleasure to be here and I should like to express my gratitude to all those who have connected. Uh, the title of my talk is Understanding Resistant Hypertension. And first of all, I will show you briefly my disclosures. As you know, I have been advisor and speaker for different companies dealing with catheters for renal denervation. The first of my slides in the talk contains the definition of resistant hypertension. As you can see, I put uh, the European Society of Hypertension Guidelines 2007 because it hasn't really changed. So we can consider a patient as being resistant whenever he or she is receiving three drugs at adequate doses, maximally tolerated doses, one of them being a diuretic, and we cannot see that blood pressure has gone below the gold value of 140 over 90. So this is the usual definition and most guidelines uh, agree in the sense that uh, this is the adequate uh, definition. So in the second of my slides, as you can see, according to the definition, we can see resistant hypertension in grade one, grade two, grade three, and in isolated systolic hypertension in the classification of the different grades of hypertension according to the European Society of Hypertension Guidelines. I mean, if it, sh if it was the JNC7, it should be, you know, a stage one and a stage two, an isolated systolic hypertension. You can also see there malignant hypertension. Malignant hypertension is a different phenotype. It's risky, very risky, no doubt. We still see it. But remember that, for example, malignant hypertension is characterized by tremendous changes in the retina, you know, with the presence of hemorrhages and exudates and papilledema, which is not seen in resistant hypertension. This is mm -hmm. a detail in clinical practice that could be of some value. Uh, David Calhoun uh, and uh, a series of uh, excellent people from the United States in the field of hypertension published in 2008 a position paper in circulation and, and uh, in hypertension in which uh, they deal with uh, resistant hypertension. That, that paper contributed very much to, to, to reconsider the relevance of resistant hypertension. And I put this slide because they used two other definitions of uh, resistant hypertension. So one is that uh, those with four or more drugs being controlled, they consider them as resistant. I believe that this is, this is not adequate. If they are well controlled, they are difficult to control, but finally they got the adequate control. And the other definition is, uh, you know, 
that patients requiring four or, or more drugs are considered as refractory hypertension. Uh, uh, we don't use really this term. I mean, we consider anything above three or more drugs is already resistant or refractory the way you prefer to denominate this. What? Luis, maybe I can interrupt you there for a second. Uh, I just would be interested in your personal view. A lot of colleagues I know of are not really very happy with the definition of resistant hypertension. If your blood pressure is in fact controlled, let's say on four antihypertensive drugs. Can I ask what your personal view on this definition is? Well, I, I, I think uh, uh, with Roland Schmieder and Bernard Bevera and Massimo, we published a paper dealing with this fact. So there is a term uh, that uh, we consider important is when you get to three drugs and you are not controlled, you can be considered as resistant. But in this moment, the term resistant means that this is a difficult to control hypertension. And I say this because many of those who initially are resistant, I mean, can get control if things are done mm -hmm. correctly. Mm -hmm. And then since that moment, I mean, I, I, I don't like to consider anymore that this patient is resistant. This patient is already controlled, requiring four drugs or five drugs, so it's so a difficult weird. to control hypertension, which is an easier way, I mean, to understand the problem. I see. So, what do we know about resistant hypertension? I mean, these are data from the NHANES, the surveys that are repeatedly made in the United States, which is a very good example that unfortunately we have partially here in Europe with the Euroaspire, but we should need to have this in, in, in population. And the important point of this is that, as you can see, I mean, in the last three NHANES, I mean, there was a clear increase in resistant hypertension according to the definition of three medications and on control above 140 over 90 medication. Why is this so? Well, probably, I mean, the increase in obesity, more prevalent diabetes and other comorbidities could account probably for this theoretical increase in, uh, you know, the prevalence of resistant hypertension. So, but then it comes a point which is very important, which is the role of ABPM and home blood pressure in the correct diagnosis of resistant hypertension. Everything I said is related to office blood pressure. But what about ABPM? What about home blood pressure? Do they play a role in, in the definition of resistant hypertension? These are data we published in 2011 in hypertension. This comes from the Spanish registry of ABPM and Alex de la Sierra published this paper. The prevalence of resistant hypertension in primary care in Spain was 12%, a really high prevalence. One month later, in the same journal hypertension, a similar prevalence was published for the United States. And recently, data in different European countries uh, indicate that probably this is an adequate uh, figure for the prevalence of resistant hypertension. But look, I mean, the importance of ABPM is, as you can see in the figure, in 37.5% of this 12%, blood pressure on ABPM was well controlled so they were pseudo-resistant. This allowed us to introduce the need, you know, for ABPM to consider any hypertensive as being a real resistant hypertensive. The others are considered as uh, partly resistant. These are the definitions we use. Daytime above an you know, ABPM uh, has to be, to be controlled below 135 over 85, 24 hour blood pressure below 130 over 80, and nighttime blood pressure below 120 over 70. And this was found in 37.5% of the patients with resistant hypertension in primary care. So Luis, if I can interrupt once more, um, what you're saying is pretty much that an ambulatory blood pressure monitor you would consider mandatory in the setting of resistant hypertension to make the diagnosis or un identify pseudo-resistance or white coat hypertension, whatever you may encounter. Yes, is there, I think it's absolutely needed. You could also use home blood pressure. I haven't quoted it, but it's exactly the same. I mean, home blood pressure can give you an idea that the patient is really well controlled whenever he lives you know, the, the, the office. And uh, so the, the white coat effect of... of uh